Welcome back, my steel design friends. In our last video, I showed you how to use the AIC manual to determine whether you are in the inelastic buckling region or the elastic buckle re bu buckling region for columns. And we use the equations and kind of a guess and check methodology for sizing a column. Okay, in this video, I'm going to show you how to use the tables to be able to jump to that a whole lot faster and eliminate a lot of the guess and check. Okay, and so without further ado, let's get started. So we'll start by looking at that same example that we had in our last video in which I had 95 kips dead load, 100 kips live load, and a column length of 16 feet. We found that the factor load was 274 kips. It was a pin-pin connection, so K was 1.0. So my KL ended up being 192 inches, or in this case, ended up being 16 feet. Okay, now, when you use the equations, you have to convert this KL value to inches because you're dividing it by KL over R and you need the units to cancel to be able to make this 4.71 square root of E over FY check. Okay, if we want a faster way to do this, I'll show you that one now. So we'll keep in mind that I need 274 kips and I need 16 feet as a KL value on this. If you go to section four of the table, okay, and the way that you find that is, you can kind of see it's the section labeled COL, this stands for columns, it's part four, it's the design of compression members. And you flip into table 4.1, on here. I'm going to zoom this out just a little bit so we can see what happens. What they've done is for normal buildings, we made the comment in the last video that normal column sizes are somewhere between a W8 and a W14 typically for normal building sizes. Okay, if you're outside of that range, you have really heavy loads or really light loads, then you'll need to do the, the method I showed you in the last video where you do it by hand. But for common sizes, this is these calculations become you know, re repeated just enough that we can start to look at the AISC available strength in axial compression tables. Okay, now one thing that you want to notice, I'm in a W shape table, I'm in an FY of 50 KSI. You gotta make sure you get into the right, into the right uh, values. You can see they actually have 70 KSI uh, tables also. Okay, and what we have then is if we look at the table on this axis here, we have our KL value Okay, so, in the, which would be our KL measured in feet. Now, I want you to pay special attention to the note that is right here. These, K, these tables are set up such that the effective length L, okay, with respect to the least radius of gyration, are Y. Okay, so one, one of the checks that we'll do um, a little bit later is what happens if this isn't the case. So there will be a correction we have to make in order to use the tables, but if all I want is just the Y direction buckling load, okay, or a Y direction failure, these tables will get it for me. And all you do is you look for section size, here's a W14, and then the next row of numbers is the actual weight. So this is a 14 by, you know, 550. And if I look at the LRFD tables and I come down, and let's just say we were looking at a member that was 20 feet long, come across, you know that that would be worth 59, 20 kips, you know, almost 6 million pounds. Okay, that is a monster, monster, monster column. Okay, so obviously we only need 274 for ours. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of flip through and just very quickly, what you can do is for our case where we said we needed KL of 16 feet and a PU of 274, we can very quickly go in and read off all of the different sizes that will start to work. So I'm gonna come across on the 16 line over here and I can see that even a W14 by 193 is worth 2170. So we're still way too large. All right, let's flip over to the next page. Let's go, let's jump down to say a 14 by, I don't know, 68. And if I come across on the 16, he's worth 577. So what you can do is you can actually come across on your L line and your KL value and read all the way across and take the first value that is larger than the number that you want. We want 274 for ours, so that would be this guy, 303. And so that is a W14 by 48. So what we'll do is we'll make a note of that one. So W14 by 48 is a good first guess, and that took all of about 10 seconds to find it, okay? And so we'll also jot down VPN on this as being 303 kips. Okay, well now, is that the best, best choice? Well, 
If we're looking for the most economical shape, I need to find the one that's the lightest. So let's go through and let's do the same thing for a W12, a W10, and a W8 in these tables. Okay, and so if I do that, we'll just go real quick through here. Here's W12. Um, my W12s. And again, we're on the 16 line. So that's the top of this one, 453, 326, 290, 257. The 290 is my winner. Okay, and so this becomes a W12 by 45. Okay, VPN is equal to 290 kips. Okay, All right, so we had a 48, a 45. So already the W12 is a lighter member for us. <clears throat> okay, so then we can come in and do the same thing for a 10s. And this will get a little bit faster. 16, 471, 427, 307, 260, too low. We're at the 307. So this is a W10 by 45. VPN is equal to 307 kips. Okay, that gets me that. And then we can come in and we can look at um, our W8 is only on one page at 16. And so 487, 418, 340. Whoops. Get that over there where you guys can all see it. Uh, 340, 275. So I could go W8 by 40 on this. VPN is 275 kips. Okay, and then obviously 241 would be too little. So if I look at my table values that we just wrote up, I now have four options. You can see that the lightest one is this guy. So from a pure weight and economic standpoint, a W8 by 40 would be your first choice, okay, for this particular column design, okay. And what it's done is it's included all of the RXs and all of the RYs and those kind of things, okay. But we've looked, but we need to be a little bit mindful. I'm a little hesitant on this one, okay. And the reason is, is that the factored load was 274 and the column is safe by all means. But we are so close to the actual limit on the loads that if this building is ever redesigned or repurposed, I don't have a lot of room for any future expansion. Okay, so I might argue, mm, I don't like being that close to the number. I mean, you'd be within your rights. This is engineering judgment. And as long as you can justify your decision, you're allowed to use a W8 by 40. If it were me, I would probably bump up to the next lightest size, which would be a W12 by 45. I don't think there's another 10 that's... Yeah, we could go to a 10 by 45, which would get us, um, yeah, 45, W8 by 48. Yeah, so so the next size up for an eight is an eight by 48, which would be heavier. So we're gonna leave the eights and I would jump up then into a W12 or a W10 on this. So now you've got a tie, 45 and 45, which one do you choose? Well, unless there's a reason that I need to use a 12 inch column or versus a 10 and it's the same weight, I'm taking the one that has the higher capacity. Okay, again, a little bit of extra cheap insurance. So this one is probably my choice. Okay, so W8 by 40 will work. Okay, but a W10 by 45 um, is preferred. Now again, this is the engineer's decision, not AISC's requirement. Okay, so, but that's how you do it. And that's how you can use these tables to do it. You just gotta make sure you get into the right table. It has to be a 50 KSI table, don't get over here on those. Okay, so that's one methodology. Okay, now what happens if you don't have standard shapes? So this is for I-beams. If you flip back a little bit, you can see they get into tube steels, HSSs. Um, that's all fine and good. I think there's some pipe steels. There's a square square tubes. Kind of as you kind of flip back through here, here are the rounds. You know, all very common structural shapes for uh, for columns. Okay, but what happens if you have something that's a little unorthodox? Okay, maybe I'm looking, you know, that I'm gonna to try to do some sort of, you know, double angle type of support kind of thing on here. Well, from section properties, you know, I can get KL over R, okay? In fact, my students, this is why I had you guys do the section property calculator that you did in Excel, is so that you could generate any of these and very quickly get your radius of gyration. That's why that term is so important on there. Well, what we can do, Let's just say that we're going back and we don't know the, the, the KL over R value that we want on this, or say that, you know, I don't want to go through dealing with all of these formulas and I even do want to just take a guess at a 10 by 49. If you can get a KL over R, you know, um, that's required or for a specific member on this, 
then what I can do is I can flip to another table that's in the very back of this section, okay? And this is table 414, okay? And they're up on, uh, I believe it starts, starts on 4-229, uh, okay? So we're gonna look at table 4-14, okay? And this is uh, page four, dash 229 what this is is this is the available critical stress for compression members okay based on an effective length okay so this says le over r this is basically kl over r the one that controls remember the highest of the two controls and for every possible value of kl over r you know for different grades of steel here's a 30 35 KSI steel, here's a 36, here's a 46, here's a 50, 65, and even a 70 KSI yield strength on there. For every KL over R value in this column, I have what is phi FCR here, okay? So my phi FCR on this, you know, notice the one thing to note in this table is that phi is already included. So this is a factored critical stress. And so if I wanted, that uh, 76 number that was in the last example, you know, if I wanted to, to just kind of double check my Euler calculations, 76 is here, right? If I flip down, this one only goes to 40, I think it's about 40 per page. So we're gonna be over here on, um, what do we say, 76. So 76 is down here. And if I come over to the 50 KSI column, uh, what do we say, we said 76. Okay, the phi FCR value is said to be 29.8 KSI. Okay, so if I write that down, that's the value that I would read out of this table. This is for KL over R equals 76 and for FY equals 50 KSI coming out of this table. Okay, well, what happens is, is if you remember from our calculation that we did over here, we found FCR to be 32.75 KSI, okay? From before, so we had FCR equals 32.75 KSI. So then phi FCR, and we didn't actually calculate it this way in the last one, but you did it kind of implied in here. 32.75 KSI is that number, all right? Let's throw it in my calculator real quick. It should be the same number, okay? This is 29.5 KSI, okay? And if you look, it's basically the same, okay? So that's what this table is doing. There's probably some round off or something that's happening in this, okay? Maybe. I carried, you know, two decimal places and maybe they rounded it to 33 or, or whatever the case may be. But that's where it comes from. This table, if you plot out every value of K over R versus FCR, as we talked about in that curve or in the, you know, the general equation, you know, for this guy, if you plot out every K over R value, this table right here will plot that curve, okay? an elastic region and an elastic region. I don't have to worry about any of the checks. I can jump straight into the formula and we're good to go. This is a really super handy table. For years, it was in the allowable stress design methodology books. And even when I was learning LRFD, you know, as a practicing engineer, I had that table from the other design methodology because it was so stinking easy to use, okay? And so column designs are super easy with this table. So that's another AISC methodology that you can choose to use for our calculations there. But otherwise, those are all just ways to kind of verify, you know, a particular size. Um, you now know how to use the tables to take a guess and actually close in on an answer rather than taking a blind guess. Because, you know, remember our example when we worked it in the last video, our trial size, if you look at it, we said was a W10 by 49. So that was just a shot in the dark, a guess. The actual size that we needed was a 10 by 45. So just a little bit of experience and some rules of thumb got me close, but this guy gets you right there right fast. Okay, so it works as long as you have the tables for the appropriate grades of steel. If you don't have the proper tables for it, then you have to go back and you have to do the formulas as they were outlined in this methodology. But for the common ones, which is what we're, most of us use, these two tables are awesome alternatives. 
Okay, and so that's what we have. So hopefully that made sense to you. As always, leave us some comments down below. Let us know if you got any questions. And if not, uh, be sure to like and subscribe to the video and we will see you guys next time. Uh, be engineering, see you guys, bye.